begrüße Sie herzlich im Namen des Dialogzentrums Berlin. Wir haben zurzeit Jerry Armstrong zu Besuch und wir arbeiten schon sehr lange mit ihm zusammen. Unter anderem haben wir vor vielen Jahren gemeinsam gegründet das Europäisch-Amerikanische Komitee, Bürgerkomitee für Religionsfreiheit in den Vereinigten Staaten von Nordamerika. Dieses Komitee hat zum Ziel, dafür zu sorgen, dass jemand aus, äh, aus der Organisation wie Scientology austreten kann, ohne dass er verfolgt wird, dass er frei darüber reden kann, dass ähm, Akten, die über ihn angelegt worden sind, nicht dazu genutzt werden, um ihn zu erpressen und an der freien Meinungsäußerung zu hindern und ähnliches. Wir haben diese aktuelle Veranstaltung speziell äh, für Anonymous und für die Internet-Community angesetzt, weil es in der letzten Zeit Diskussionen darüber gibt, wie die Auseinandersetzung mit Scientology zu führen ist. Das Dialogzentrum Berlin vertritt dabei die Ansicht, dass das Wesentliche in der Auseinandersetzung sozusagen den Nagel auf den Kopf zu äh, treffen ist, sich mit der Lehre einer Organisation wie Scientology zu befassen. Ähm, Missbräuche gibt es überall, aber wenn man sich mit der Lehre auseinandersetzt, dann trifft man wirklich den Nagel auf den Kopf. Und deshalb wollen wir äh, also an dieser Position auch festhalten und haben Jerry eingeladen, ähm, zu informieren darüber, wie es wie seine Geschichte mit Scientology ist, insbesondere nachdem es in den letzten Tagen ausgesprochen bösartige Angriffe im Internet gegen Jerry gegeben hat, die ähm, von Marty Rasborn und seinen Anhängern äh, ins Internet gesetzt worden sind. Ganz bösartig wurde zum Beispiel behauptet, dass Jerry schuld daran sei, dass Bob Minton zugrunde gerichtet worden ist, weil Jerry Bob Minton veranlasst habe, ihn äh, mit einem Computer zu unterstützen. Ich weiß von meinem Freund Bob Minton, dass er von sich aus Jerry einen Computer angeboten und geschenkt hat und dass er ihn von sich aus unterstützt hat, weil er nämlich gern in Konzert mit Jerry arbeiten wollte. Und das ist genau eine der Formulierungen aus der äh, unterdrückerischen äh, aus den unterdrückischen Urteilen gegen Jerry, dass äh, äh, Personen, die mit ihm in Konzert, also in Abstimmung mit ihm arbeiten, genauso von Scientology bedroht und verfolgt werden können, aufgrund dieser Urteile wie Jerry Armstrong selbst. Das Dialogzentrum Berlin ist stolz darauf, dass es mit Jerry in Konzert arbeitet und wir wir freuen uns, dass er jetzt äh, uns ein Statement gibt und dass er dann auch alle Fragen beantworten wird, die, äh, die denkbar sind. Dankeschön, dass Sie gekommen sind. Well, it's nice to talk to you all and to again see so many friendly faces. Um, I, I know that the announcement said that um, I was in Berlin uh, to talk about uh, Rathbun and Rinder, and although I am going to talk about them, as uh, Pastor Gando said, um, I was already planning to be here, so it's just a coincidence that Rathbun was here just a few days ago, and uh, I'm here now to respond to uh, some of, some of the things and to give some of my history that interacts with Rathbun and Rinder. Uh, I knew Rinder, first of all, on the ship, the Apollo. Uh, I was on board from 1971 through 1975, and Rinder was on board a, a number of those years, so we knew each other for quite a long time. And then I met Rathbun, I believe it was 1978, at that time in uh, Gilman Hot Springs, which is the current uh, headquarters of Scientology. 
and both of them were involved in legal operations and covert operations and, and uh, a number of, number of things, a lot of black propaganda, which the two of them generated uh, throughout the years. I left the organization in 1981, and I think my history is probably known to some extent by everyone, but I'll just give a few little highlights of it. I was in the Sea Organization from 71 through 81, and in Scientology a total of uh, 12 and a half years. And most importantly, among all those years, I did the research in my final two years for the biography of Robert. And during the course of that research and assembling Hubbard's personal archive, I discovered and documented the fact that the man had lied about virtually every part of his life. And this was extremely significant to me because I was quite dedicated to the truth. I was brought in to Scientology on the basis that they had this truth and I stuck it out for all those years through very terrible conditions. I was twice assigned to the RPF for a total of 25 months. Uh, Hubbard ordered my marriage broken up inside and uh, really it, it was a, a actually a terrible time but I survived it and when I saw that Hubbard had lied about so many things, uh, my then wife and I made plans to leave and we did. Before I left, I had worked for a year and some months with an outside, a WOG writer and provided him with a mass of documents which came straight from Hubbard's archives. It's ironic that during that period of time when I was working on Hubbard's biography, uh, we inside the organization could not admit that we were in communication with Hubbard because the IRS, the FBI, and a number of victims of Scientology who had lawsuits were trying to get to Hubbard and have him served with legal process. So we all lied, we all knew that, that there was a line of communication to Hubbard, but we couldn't admit it, and so there was uh, little communication, and I had a few communications with him during that period of time. Uh, but I had a relatively, relative freedom to travel around the world, assemble documents, read Hubbard's own archive and provide these documents to this outside writer. Omar Garrison was his name. Garrison had already written books uh, about Scientology, very pro-Scientology books. And during my delivery to Garrison of these documents, we both came to the conclusion about Hubbard as a gargantuan liar. And by the way, um, I, I really look forward to answering your questions at, at any time. And I know I'm, I'm just proceeding in English with the assumption that everyone will either understand or someone will create subtitles at some point and everyone will understand. So, but if there is something uh, you want me to stop and just just tell me and uh, I hope that you do have lots of good questions I, I like answering questions more than I like just uh, talking the way I'm talking right now in any case I left in December of 1981 and I left with the hope that Scientology would not come after me but of course, I was quite aware that it was their policy to come after people like me 
and I was in a particularly vulnerable position because of the sensitivity of the material that I had been handling. And of course, I was still connected to the writer, Omar Garrison. In fact, uh, my wife and I used his car, uh, his little truck, to escape from Scientology and drive from Los Angeles, where I was, up to Canada in December of 1981. Uh, Garrison then offered me a job working in his publishing company. So after Christmas 1981, my wife and I turned around, came back south, and we got a little trailer in uh, Costa Mesa, California, which is just south of Los Angeles in Orange County. And almost immediately, we picked up surveillance, and we knew uh, from contacts that were being made with our respective families that uh, the Guardian's office at that time were coming after us. Some years later, uh, while testifying in the Christofferson case, I uh, hope you're all familiar with that, it's the case of Julie Christofferson versus Scientology, which went to trial in Portland, Oregon in 1985. And while testifying in that trial, a number of documents came out through Scientology, which showed that they had immediately be started an operation to get close to me and uh, they went through all of my files, of course, my auditing files, and they enlisted the help of Dan Sherman. Dan Sherman, you may know, is the current L. Ron Hubbard biographer. I knew him inside the organization. We were reasonably good friends. I was in the Sea Org. He was a public person, but he had done uh, operations for the intelligence uh, for the intelligence arm of the Guardian's office. And he is a writer of spy stories, or was at that time. I had worked in intelligence inside the organization. So I had an understanding of intelligence, of espionage, and he, of course, did as well. So we had a lot to talk about, and he was a friendly guy. And, this, and the document which surfaced in the Christofferson case showed that right from the beginning of 1982 he had been enlisted to get close to me and that ultimately uh, he drew me into what was then known as the loyalist operation. There were, he claimed that there was a group of people inside the organization, some 35 people, who wanted to reform it they called themselves the Loyalists, and they wanted to get David Miscavige thrown out. They said David Miscavige is a criminal, and they want to get him put in jail. And I'll, I'll talk more about that, but you probably will recognize the same pattern that's going on now. People leave the organization, they claim to be Loyalists, that is loyal to the technology or loyal to L. Ron Hubbard, and that David Miscavige is the criminal that they want to get rid of. Uh, so right after, right after leaving, as I said, I picked up surveillance, and I knew that I knew that I was under attack. In February of 1982, Scientology published a suppressive person declare on me. I knew what that meant. It meant that I was a a significant enemy. In April 1982, they published another suppressive person declare on me with more charges, more black propaganda. And at that point, uh, I, one more thing they did, I had a bunch of uh, photographs from inside, from the wedding that I had, uh, Hubbard, attended the wedding, so there was a number of pictures of Hubbard. They didn't have any uh, significance to me anymore, but they had some uh, monetary value, and so I wanted to 
to sell these because when you leave Scientology, you're, you leave virtually penniless. So my wife and I had not a cent between us. Uh, we both got jobs and fortunately we got jobs in the law business. So both of us became educated to some degree in legal affairs and which helped me incredibly to stand up to the organization for these last almost 30 years. Uh, so, uh, I was going to sell these photos, but uh, Scientology heard of it and they stole them. They stole those photos and they stole two other sets of photos from other people who had left the organization and we all pooled our resources together to sell these photos. Scientology stole them and I determined at that time that, uh, that I had to do something about it and through a series of coincidences I hooked up with an attorney, Michael Flynn. Michael Flynn is a, at that time was a Boston attorney and he was sort of the driving force around the world at that time in the opposition to Scientology. And he had a number of cases and almost instantly he took on my case as well. So then I had something of a, a legal defense. Uh, knowing what Scientology was doing and the legal threat to, to myself, I went back to Omar Garrison who I had remained friendly with and who uh, I had continued to help because I had the research mind and I, I knew my way through these documents which I had earlier provided to him. And because he felt, he was afraid that Scientology was going to steal the documents back from him, he made a duplicate set of them. So I helped him copy documents and then as time went on, I provided a number of them that I felt were necessary to defend myself to my lawyer, Michael Flynn. And those became the subject of the first lawsuit that Scientology sued me. And the, the, the first suit was August 2, 1982. Marty Rathbun has said that he became responsible, he became in charge under Miscavige and under Hubbard at that time when the lawsuit got filed. So from then on, aside from brief periods when he was doing something else, he was instrumental in all of the activities, all of the black PR, all of the covert operations, and all of the lawsuits. Ultimately, they have sued me uh, six times uh, and th the private investigators which he ran assaulted me, drove into me physically with a car and terrorized my wife and me on a Southern California highway. Uh, the, this guy, private investigator, uh, got right in front of us and then slammed on the brakes hoping that we would drive into him. We had a a very small uh, Fiat car and uh, we were at a terrible disadvantage in this and then this guy came, we're going like this, he came like this now and started to push us off the road. Fortunately, not, there was no accident but it was extremely scary and that was the type of intimidation which the organization used against my wife and me at that time. It, Did you went to the police? Yes. And was that was the Costa Mesa police. And, and we found out that the Scientology's private investigators had already been to the police and had black PR'd us to the police and claimed that we were criminals. Right. And, and the private investigator stood right outside the police station, Costa Mesa police, and laughed at us when we came back out because they knew that the police would not help. As I continue on, you'll see that they have involved police. A little later on, 
they, bled, they paid a Los Angeles Police Department officer at least $10,000 to give them a phony authorization to surveil uh, and eavesdrop and videotape me, my attorney, and anyone else they wanted. And that was in 1984. We're back into 1982 at this point. Uh, so, uh, in, in any case, Marty Rathbun and also Mike Rinder are both involved in, in the lawsuit against me and both involved in operations and throughout this whole period of time, Dan Sherman remains my friend. He writes me letters, he makes phone calls. We meet in, in Los Angeles sometimes. And he pretends to be uh, out of Scientology and wanting nothing to do with it, but wanted to be friends with me and uh, although his wife was still to some degree involved. So he said, I can't go to his place because his wife is there. So we had to meet in different locations, mainly in Griffith Park, which is a park in Los Angeles, fairly near the Scientology operation. Um, yes. <coughs> You, you probably know that, that Marty Rathbun ha, has, even by his own words, been known as Mr. Fixit. He was the cleanup guy. He was uh, David Miscavige's thug. Uh, Rathbun actually came to my home uh, before my trial in 1984. They tried to talk me out of going ahead uh, with the trial. On another occasion, I met with my ex-wife. They sent her to try and talk me out of it as well. And these documents, as I say, surfaced ironically in the 1985 trial of um, Julie Christofferson in Portland, Oregon. So my trial went ahead in 1984 and that is the famous Breckenridge decision where Scientology essentially accused me of stealing these documents. In truth, I had them completely lawfully. I had a contract which involved L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard personally had approved my petition to do what I did, to do the research for his biography and to provide these documents to Omar Garrison. So the judge found in my favor, he found that I was completely justified because I was fair game in sending these documents to my attorney. And he ruled, as you probably know, that L. Ron Hubbard is virtually a pathological liar when it comes to his history. I had discovered that the man had lied about being a nuclear physicist, about being a civil engineer, about how many wives he had, about how many children he he had, he he lied about being a war hero. He lied about his uh, expeditions or explorations. Yes. Could he lie about the number of children you never see or oh, met any of his children? Uh, yes, I I met uh, six of his seven children. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> But he, he lied, uh, this was his, uh, the daughter that he had by his second wife, um, Sarah Northrup, her daughter, Alexis. And he claimed that, no, that was Jack Parsons who was the father. It wasn't, Alexis looks more like L. Ron Hubbard than any of the other children. Um, and speaking of Jack Parsons, this was another thing which was very important to me, and that was uh, I, I determined and documented that Hubbard had been involved in uh, occult practices with Jack Parsons. This is the Aleister Crowley group. Hubbard had claimed in earlier 
documents which I had that he had been sent in uh, by the FBI or by naval intelligence to break up a black magic ring. Absolutely false. He was not in the military and he, uh, that is, he was not sent in by the military. He was involved in black magic and you can see a lot of occult practices if you understand Scientology and you understand the Crowley system. There are a lot of material from Crowley that Hubbard integrated into Scientology. <clears throat> what did you find out about the intelligence history of Hubbard? It, it was actually extremely minimal. He was, he was uh, hired into the the office of the cable censor in, uh, before the war, but uh, he only stayed in intelligence for a brief amount of time, and then he requested transfer uh, to a ship. And he was indeed given command of a ship, uh, and he also lost command of the ships that he was given. So the, the claim there, there is a claim which you probably are familiar with that uh, Hubbard's military uh, history was, was uh, whitewashed, uh, sheep dipped, they call it, because he was so important to the U.S. war effort that they had to make him look uh, less important than he really was. Just complete, complete garbage. He, he really had, even by his own words, and inglorious uh, history, military history. Importantly among these documents was a set of papers that came to be known as the admissions or the affirmations. And these were where he said such things as men are my slaves, elemental spirits are my slaves. And he literally programmed himself to give himself power over other, other people. Uh, and this was a very important document to me, and it has been very important to other people to free them from Hubbard's control, because it really points out uh, what his intentions actually were. He was not a nice man. He was, in fact, I have concluded, a psychopath or a sociopath. So that is a person who has uh, virtually no conscience uh, and who lies like Hubbard lied and who has no remorse, feels no guilt. And those are the essential qualities of testify in another trial in London, England. This is the trial that resulted in the famous case that's labeled Reed B and G Wards. Wards are children, B and G are first initials of the children, and this was another very scathing decision, judgment against uh, Scientology and against L. Ron Hubbard over these two children. So the non-Scientologist mother was awarded the children against the Scientology father, and Scientology itself was an issue in the case. So, when I received this telephone call from David Kluge, he wanted me to fly to uh, Nevada to pick up my PC folders, my pre-clear folders. And I, I told him, no, I would not go, and uh, for two reasons. One, I'm flying out the next day, and it's obvious they, they scheduled this operation to try and prevent me from actually flying and testifying in this trial in, in London, which was very important to them. Also, I believe that by claiming that it was in Nevada, they would then get me to cross a state line. I was then in California. If I went into Nevada to accept stolen property, that would be probably a federal offense. And in any case, they would try to prosecute me for that. So very wisely. I declined going. I went to London. I testified. And in London, they had, there was another operation against me. 
They followed me, surveilled me, and as I was flying out, I was accosted by three private investigators at London's Heathrow Airport, and they accused me of passing documents to a bearded Arab in the Old Cock Tavern. Old Cock Tavern is a, uh, a restaurant on Fleet Street, very near the, the courts where I had testified. And I had actually had a meal with my wife at the Old Cock Tavern, hadn't met a bearded Arab, hadn't met anyone. Uh, but these private investigators then executed documents, executed sworn statements claiming that I had passed these documents so that on to, to someone, this bearded Arab. Um, so then they, they filed these things in court case in the United States to try and get me in more trouble. Um, life kind of proceeded, I returned from uh, London and that's when a series of meetings began, first with Dan Sherman, and he introduced me to David Kluge. I met two times with Kluge in Griffith Park, and then I met two times with Mike Rinder. <clears throat> uh, Scientology's head private investigator at that time, a guy by the name of Eugene Ingram, who incidentally, uh, I believe Rathbun has claimed that he hired. Um, th this guy also claimed that he threatened to put a bullet between my eyes. He called me up one day and actually threatened to put a bullet between my eyes. But these meetings that I had with Kluge and Rinder uh, were videotaped. Uh, Ingram videotaped them and then they used them later in the Christofferson trial, which was in the spring of 1985. So my meetings with Kluge and Rinder were in, I believe, November 1984. And at, at one point, they broke every, everything off with me. They said that I couldn't be trusted. And uh, the reason for that was they believed that they had everything that they needed, that their trap had, had worked, and that I had said things for which I could uh, be, my, my credibility could be impugned, and I could be prosecuted, which they tried to do. During that period of time, uh, now it's very well known that L. Ron Hubbard was directly involved. So, Hubbard, of course, died in January 1986. This is in, uh, November of 1984. The trial had been ended in June of 1984. Hubbard was very much, as the Scientologists say, on the lines. And I believe that he was running this whole operation. It just has his fingerprints all over it. And Vaughn Young has told me that Hubbard was involved and had issued orders to Vaughn to get me to put a wanted dead or alive poster out on me, which Vaughn delayed and ultimately didn't do, yes? Did they ever try to kill you physically or just to kill your, um, um, it, to, kill, to, to kill your personal honor? You mean, what was their intention? Yeah. Well, I, so far, I do not believe that they have tried to kill me, but they have threatened to. So I've had a number of threats like that. I do not put it past them. And part of the reason that I speak out and keep my profile so high is for that kind of protection. Because certainly there would be a lot of attention on them if I were to show up dead one day. But I have been physically assaulted six times and as I say, driven into and terrorized on, on the freeway. So it's been dangerous, but I do not believe that they've actually tried to kill me. Will they? Who knows, as the pressure, as the pressure mounts, it, there are many historical times 
when pressure in cults mounts. There, there are no deaths in, in People's Temple before all of a sudden they, they kill a senator and they kill a congressman, right? And then they, they 900 of them commit suicide. So it can happen, that kind of pressure can happen just like that. And we should all be aware. When I was on the ship, there was a lot of talk about should, should Scientology ever be threatened, there are, very, there are key people to go out and assassinate. So it, it really could happen, and you can pro possibly tell from the amount of hate for Jerry Armstrong that comes not just from the Miscavige faction, but from the Independent faction as well. And so, and there the threat is not just from an organized assassination attempt, but Scientology uh, has a lot of people who, who are pretty crazy. So an independent Scientologist who just goes psychotic could do that, no, not on Scientology orders. We have the recent case of Rex Fowler, who you know, killed his, his office worker, and he, he was an OT7. So it, the pressure just got too much for Rex Fowler, kills people. So it can happen. Um, during my meetings with Kluge and Rinder, they attempted many times uh, to get me to say things. Uh, they, they offered one, one crime, uh, to, something to do, and I said I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole because I resisted any temptation to do anything. I, I had really no reason to do anything uh, illegal. I had just beat them completely in, the, in my own trial, in my own defense, and my lawsuit against them was proceeding ahead. So I was looking to again taking them to court this time with them as a defendant, not myself, myself as a plaintiff. And they knew that and that's why they wanted to get close to me and destroy me in some way. Um, during the Christofferson trial in 1985, that's where it became apparent that David Kluge and Mike Rinder and Dan Sherman were not my friends and that I had been lured into this trap with these protestations of friendship and um, that they had all these videotapes. And of course, if you have two or three hours of video, you really can't remember what exactly you've said, and I talk to them like I talk to you. Sometimes I talk with, with my hands, and sometimes, you know, I may, I may talk uh, bullshit, you know, or I, I, I said things that, that I shouldn't have said. You know, I made uh, crude jokes during all of this. And of course, they want to use these things to, to make me look like a complete scumbag. Um, and they've done it of, all around the world. It was so devastating during the Christofferson trial that that's the one time in my life when I actually uh, contemplated suicide because I just felt so betrayed by these people and I felt like, oh, now I've let down the whole movement you know, by getting myself entrapped by Rinder, and so I actually contemplated it and I came very close. But it was probably a good experience because I made the decision that no matter how bad it got, I wouldn't do that. One uh, question, please. Um, did you say that also Michael Flynn was not your friend? Mike Flynn? Yes. I no, Mike Rinder. <laughs> Mike Rinder? Oh, yes. Oh, 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 sorry about that. I... No, Mike. Mike Flynn, uh, okay. he, he became uh, a very good friend of me. 
uh, I, I trusted him. And after this happened, uh, and Julie Christofferson uh, won a $39 million judgment against them, in part because the jury saw that what they did to me was the proof that fair game was still continuing despite everything Scientology said about ending it. Um, so after, after this trial, and I, I really had nowhere to go in life, I lived in Portland for a little bit of time, and then Mike Flynn hired me, and I went to uh, Boston and worked with him as his paralegal in his Boston office until there was a settlement in, at the end in December 1986. So from 1985 through 1986, I worked in Boston. Immediately upon my arrival in Boston, uh, I was contacted, well, within a month, I was contacted by the FBI. And the FBI said that they, that they had a report that I had impersonated an FBI officer. And this is a federal crime for which you can be jailed, imprisoned. And uh, through my, an FBI officer came to Flynn's office, interviewed me about the circumstances, and I was able to tell from what he told me, you must understand that law enforcement don't tell you very much, they want you to tell everything, it isn't really a two-way street. But from what he said, I could tell that it was Scientology that made the claim, and, I could, and he told me where this had occurred, and it was a place in Boston I had never been to. So, uh, there was nothing more that I could do about it at that time, except I submitted a, a um, Freedom of Information Act request and was able to obtain some of the documents which related to this operation. While this was going on, Scientology then took the, the product of this, in this operation in Los Angeles, the videotape operation, and they did a number of things. They published a Freedom article, they distributed that Freedom article in Portland, they distributed it around the world. They distributed uh, a transcript, which is not a complete transcript, but edited transcripts um, to government officials. They distributed them to the uh, police. And uh, this was a time that uh, when they brought up these videos, the judge said, this is unlawful. You cannot secretly videotape someone. But, he said, these, these videos are devastating, but they're devastating <coughs> against Scientology. So he allowed the videotapes to be shown, which was terribly embarrassing and, and very painful for me, but I made it through that. So now these videos are, are public, and Scientology then created an edited version of the videos, and they brought in all of their personnel from around the world to look at the edited videos. They were regging, that is, extracting money, up to $50,000 $50, per person. They're rich people. Uh, for support to fight the IRS and Jerry Armstrong because they claimed that the IRS, uh, that I was in conspiracy with the, with the IRS over this. The truth of the matter is that the IRS had, during, during my trial and after my trial, they became very interested in it because it was about Hubbard, it was about Scientology, and it was about money. 
and uh, they were particularly interested in a set of tapes which are called the MCCS tapes, Mission Corporate Category Sort Out. I was on a mission in 1980 and 81, uh, the purpose of which was to restructure the Scientology Corporation so that L. Ron Hubbard could continue to control it and direct it and extract money from it, but not be legally held legally responsible for it. Such a thing, of course, is unlawful. You can't do that and not be responsible. But, uh, and that, the, that was the beginning of the corporate restructuring which Miscavige continued, which became RTC, CST, Bridge Publications, CSI. All of those things happened um, on the basis of Hubbard's orders. Hubbard ordered the whole thing. So, there was a, a meeting at which attorneys in the U.S., attorneys from the U.K., and the people who were involved in MCCS all met, and they discussed this, and during the discussion, essentially, they admitted to defrauding the IRS. And so the IRS got a hold of these tapes, and the IRS then used that material to continue to deny Scientology's tax exemption from 1984 through 1993. And, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, at, the, at the Christofferson trial, oh, this I have only learned within the last month. One of the other actions that Scientology did was uh, to have a, a letter writing campaign. So they brought in their people, they had them watch their, this video, their edited version of the video, and then they had their people write to their congressman and urging the congressman to uh, go after the IRS for running this COINTELPRO operation. COINTELPRO is the, it was a, an FBI operation which years before had been involved in investigating uh, groups, religious groups, uh, Martin Luther King uh, and various other, various other groups came under this large umbrella of COINTELPRO and Scientology claimed that COINTELPRO was alive and well because of what the operation that they ran against me. What they did was pervert the whole thing to make me look like the guilty party when in fact they had sucked me in and I had actually said nothing. I had not committed a crime. There was, there was nothing between me and the IRS except the fact that I was a federal witness. So the IRS, uh, I, I talked to the IRS because they were very interested in my case and they were pursuing Hubbard and Scientology was locked in battle with them in thousands of lawsuits. So, the, the way Scientology justified this operation against me was by, as I mentioned earlier, they paid an LAPD officer at least $10,000 to give them an authorization. Now it's unlawful. So an, an LAPD officer can't just sign something here, go surveil somebody, right? Somebody that you don't like. Um, and that, one sec, that, that LA, the chief of police, uh, Daryl Gates at that time, issued a statement in, in which he said those things were not authorized, the LAPD was not behind this, and the, they would never cooperate with you. It would be a cold day in hell 
when they cooperated with Gene Ingram. They know Gene Ingram is a criminal. Um, and the LAPD officer was suspended from the force. Scientology has continued to this day to claim that, that this was a legal operation and it was authorized by the LAPD. They claim that around the world. They claimed it in Russia while I was there recently. They claim it here in Germany. It's completely false. It, it was not authorized. It was unlawful. And Rinder and Rathbun were both involved in that. And recently, as I began to say, I had uncovered this letter writing campaign. Letters went to, uh, we got part of an FOIA, uh, uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, file uh, from the FBI. And this thing went right up to the top of the FBI. And the head at that time, Webster, he also wrote that there is no evidence here of the IRS doing anything improper. The, they then tried to have me prosecuted with the Los Angeles District Attorney. The, the LA uh, District Attorney wrote the same thing. There is no crime here. The fact that Armstrong may, may have uh, talked to them is nothing. But to this day, they continue to, to claim that it's a crime. And this is where it, it would be very helpful if Rathbun and Rinder came forward and told the truth about this. One, it could clear my files with the IRS and the FBI. It could clear my reputation around the world. And it's significant to me that they do not come forward. Um, Scientology also, before there was a settlement in December 1986, but Scientology, one more thing they did was cull my PC folders. So, as you know, a person divulges all of his secrets during the counseling process. They took out of there all kinds of things, things that are embarrassing, things for which perhaps I could be prosecuted, just, you know, things that I did even as a small child. Um, and they even invented things. So it wasn't even exactly my history, but they embellished my history to make it look even worse than it was. They took that and presented it to the judge in the case, Judge Breckenridge, they presented it to attorneys. Judge Breckenridge was a very good and strong man, and he went through my PC folders himself and said, no, here's what, here's what it contains, here's what it would show. Here, this guy is not what you're saying he is. There was no justification for Scientology to do that. I wanted to get my pre-clear folders so that I could look at them, so that I could understand the process that I had been subjected to. And I had no intention of using them in my trial. There was no need. But they're my files. I had a right to them. I had a right to know what was in them. And so during this process, they, they did one of the most evil things when they culled those PC folders as they did. It is just as if a priest went to the authorities with everything that was confessed to him and had no reason. It wasn't that I was intending to commit a crime or that I had ever committed a crime. It was just embarrassing things from years ago, years when I was a child. So, then we come to uh, oh, when they brought me into this videotape operation, one, one of the, the things that they used to lure me in was that 
they believe that an operation against my attorney, Michael Flynn, that he was actually innocent and they wanted to prove that he was innocent. What Scientology did was frame him similarly to the way they framed Paulette Cooper, they framed me, and they framed Flynn with uh, passing a forged $2 million check on an L. Ron Hubbard account. Flynn had nothing to do with it, but Rathbun personally traveled with Gene Ingram around the country, uh, black PR and Flynn about this check, and they paid known criminals. They paid a, a mafia member in Boston $33,000 to implicate Flynn. They paid a known criminal in jail in uh, Naples, Italy $25,000 to sign a, a declaration which they wrote to frame Flynn. They tried to have him prosecuted and the prosecutors just laughed at it. But they just would not stop. Flynn claimed that they broke up his, uh, his marriage. I know they planted agents in his office. He claimed that they tampered with his private plane and uh, attempted to assassinate him. So, and I was working through, in Flynn's office, I knew that he was innocent, and I, that's one of the things, as I say, they used to lure me into this operation. They wanted my help to clear Flynn's name. They didn't want my help at all. They were trying to get me to, to hurt Flynn and hurt myself. So, in, in the end, in December of 1986, Flynn announced that Scientology had agreed to settle all of the cases in which he represented victims of Scientology. There were some 20 people that Flynn represented, and it, including me. I had the, the biggest case of all of his people. Some people that he represented had already settled. Um, and there had been talks for throughout those years, from 82 through 86, there were many discussions of settling these cases. And I can tell you that uh, I don't mind compulsion to go to trial again. I had already testified for some 45 days in probably 20 cases. I had executed dozens uh, written and executed dozens of declarations or affidavits containing my knowledge about Hubbard and Scientology. So I was not looking forward to trial, but I was willing to go forward to trial. My, uh, my trial was then scheduled for just a month away. I had survived everything that they had done, and now it is my turn to go to trial. But if they want to settle, if they want to end this, I'm happy with it. Flynn was out in Los Angeles at that time. I'm in Boston. He called up and he said, it's arranged. I had already agreed with Flynn on a monetary amount to settle the case. And I had communicated to him that I will not sign any kind of gag order. I will not be silenced. I'm willing to settle. I'm willing to walk away. I'm even willing to not, not talk to the media. Because even talking to the media is not always a comfortable situation. It's not even easy to talk to you guys, although it's probably as easy as <laughs> any other group on the planet. So thank you for that. Uh, talks of settlement and uh, I had told Flynn that I would not sign such a gag order, which I knew was Scientology's standard practice. I considered that these things were wrong, 
And I knew that it was impossible for me to live, to live by it. So, Flynn then said, it's all done. Settlement is going ahead. And it's a global settlement. So all of Flynn's um, clients are going to settle. He flew me out to Los Angeles. I met with Flynn. And I know I've written about this uh, many times. Uh, this was probably right up there with the really troubling incidents in my life. When I got to LA, Flynn was in a hotel room. He gave me the document which I am expected to sign. It's this 16-page uh, so-called settlement agreement, uh, which is on my website. And by the way, virtually everything I've talked about here, there's documentation about on my website. So you can see it there, you can get more in detail, you can find out uh, really all the details beyond the little points that I'm covering here. I read this document. So that means that Scientology does not have to prove that they are damaged by what I say. It's just automatic. It's assumed that everything I say is worth $50,000 per utterance, and that I have to pay that should I break the silence. It also, it also refers not only to my experiences and my knowledge of Scientology, but I also cannot speak about any of the Scientology corporations, any group, any affiliated entity. I cannot speak about their directors, officers, employees, volunteers, agents, even lawyers. I can't even mention a name of Scientology's lawyers, $50,000. I said, Mike, I, I, can't, I can't sign this. I said, what if I, what if I find a girl that I like and I want to go out with? And I, I, she says, what have you been doing for the last 17 years? $50,000. What if I go to a doctor and he says, you look like a bit stressed. What's going on in your life? $50,000. I said, Mike, this is impossible. And he said, Jerry, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. You cannot sign away your constitutional rights. But they have promised to end fair game if everybody signs. They, they have promised that they are going to walk away. You will never hear from them. He, and um, I still resisted. And, and I was just, just crushed because I had already told him I wouldn't sign it. He presents it. And then he said, Jerry, They've destroyed my life. They've destroyed my marriage. I've got to get out of this. So now I, his client, am made responsible for his peace. And all of the other people, all the other people who are victims, I'm responsible for them. And then I still resisted. And he brought a, another client who had been in intelligence in the organization. And this guy sat down and he literally screamed at me, just yelled, you're killing it for everyone. What are you getting? You've got to sign. And a lot of these people were desperate for money. A lot of them were desperate to have fair game end because all of them were targets. Not like me, because I, I was in a kind of unique position. But they were also all victims. So I was kind of made responsible for all of this. The, and I saw at that time, it was like this weird vision that I've talked about, where I saw like in, way into the future, and it is, it's 30 years into the future, where I was going to be haunted and hunted by these people, and, and deserted by 
everybody, and a lot of that has happened. Pardon me. So, because of all of this, because I was crushed, that's why I saw him. And that's what Marty calls selling out. And that's why the Indies hate me. Anyway, so immediately I signed this thing and of course I, I was glad to have, to have it end and to be able to, to some degree, get on with my life. But Scientology would not let me. Within days, they took a mass of material to the Los Angeles Times, and the LA Times was writing at that time uh, their, their famous series. There's an LA Times series which is really quite famous. They were working on it at that time, and now I'm in a position where I can't respond. So I'm still the target of this black propaganda. The, the contract itself is worded very strangely, so it gives you the idea that it's reciprocal. That is, they're going to be silent about me, I'm supposed to be silent about them. And the truth is, I cannot and I could not ever be silent. It's just impossible. You, you, anything in, in life, you, you just find you have to talk about your last 17 years. You can't stop. It's, it's an impossible situation that they put me in. But they continued to black PR me. They, they uh, then threatened me a number of times that if I, if I answered, when they, they filed their black propaganda in various cases, if I answered, they were going to come after me again. So for a period of time, I just sort of lived in this hope that they were going to end this, the fair game, and that there would be sort of a, you know, a reformation inside, and, you know, but it, it didn't happen, and it actually got, got worse. They filed a bunch of affidavits in the Russell Miller case. Russell Miller is a, uh, he wrote one of the famous Hubbard biographies, he had interviewed me and used uh, my knowledge and documents from my Los Angeles case as a basis for his book. Uh, they sued him, and then they threatened that, uh, and then they filed a bunch of affidavits about me and threatened that if I talk to Miller's attorneys, they would have me prosecuted. They did the same with uh, the Ben Corridan case. They, they published black propaganda on me. They continued to publish ugly things about me. And then in the, the fall, October period of 1989, uh, I was served with a deposition subpoena in the Corridan case. Uh, subpoena is something that compels you. You have to show up and testify. So even though I'm now compelled by legal process to testify. I received a telephone call from Scientology attorney Lawrence Heller, and he threatened that even if I obey the subpoena, they will prosecute me. They wanted me to go into court and tell the court to refuse to, to force court and to get a court order, and that I should refuse. They wanted me to have a Scientology lawyer represent me against my friend Ben Corden. And so that's when I made the decision that I could not let this stand and that I had to do something and I was, had to speak out. The first action that I took was to petition the Court of Appeal. <coughs> Uh, that's a bit of a, an irony because 
1984, there was the famous Breckenridge decision in my case. Scientology appealed from it. And uh, in December of 1986, the Court of Appeal had rejected Scientology's appeal on the basis that my cross-complaint had not been tried. My cross-complaint was what was scheduled to go to trial when the settlement happened. So the Court of Appeal sent it back to them. They then refiled, but for whatever reason, I, I think it's a Scientology reason, the file got lost for three years. So then uh, the Court of Appeal found the file. My attorney, Flynn, who's now out of it, uh, notified me that this appeal is going on. So I petitioned the Court of Appeal in order to participate in my own appeal because the, the contract prohibits me even from defending myself in my own appeal. So the Court of Appeal granted that petition and they also made public the, the settlement contract. So now the whole world began to see what was going on. And uh, Scientology, of course, continued to uh, attack me with a lot of black propaganda. And in 1991, they filed their first action against me to enforce the settlement contract. And that was in LA Superior Court. And this was a motion to enforce. And the judge who had inherited my case from Judge Breckenridge, who had retired, he ruled that this is one of the most one-sided, unfair contracts he had ever seen. And he said, I know that we like to settle cases, but we do not want, we do not like to prostrate the court, you know, make the court lay down uh, and create an injustice. So Scientology then went okay, then they filed a new lawsuit against me. And there they found a very favorable judge. And this judge stamped whatever they put in front of him and ultimately ruled that the contract was lawful, that $50,000 per utterance was fair, and, and he issued an injunction. Must be remembered that this judge did not allow the case to go to trial. So he made all of these rulings without a trial. I had no trial in this case. So he ruled that, that there was no duress involved. Duress is pressure. And you can probably imagine from what I've just told you the amount of pressure that I was under when I had to sign this document. The pressure was enormous. He ruled that no, no pressure, because of course, uh, such a contract is not lawful if you're under pressure when you sign it. And he, and, uh, he ruled as well that, oh, it's totally okay, you can sign away your, your, your First Amendment free speech rights. Well, the fact is you cannot sign away all your, free, all your First Amendment rights. You cannot sign away your freedom of religion. And there are many instances where you cannot sign away your, your freedom of speech. You can't sign it away about a religion, and you can't sign it away if you have to defend yourself. I had a complete right to defend myself against ongoing attacks. Nevertheless, he ruled against me, and uh, he signed Scientology's injunction, and he gave them uh, $50,000 uh, per utterance. That drove me into bankruptcy, and even in the bankruptcy court, they sued me again. And, and they sued me to prevent me from discharging that debt, well, hundreds of thousands of dollars, 
which I could, should be able to lawfully do. I didn't have any money, couldn't pay hundreds of thousands of dollars, so they, they made me bankrupt. And ultimately, I won that case in the bankruptcy court. There was a trial, I won that, and I was able to discharge that debt. Uh, but he signed this injunction, and again, the injunction prohibits me from uh, mentioning Scientology, mentioning officers, directors, uh, employees, volunteers. Every volunteer minister, as soon as they become even a volunteer minister, these people become beneficiaries in this contract and in this injunction. Scientology, the, the injunction is so broad, it involves every Scientologist everywhere in the world. Here in Germany it applies. It applies in Russia. It applies around the world. So, and these people are all what are known as beneficiaries. They are parties to this contract and the injunction. That is very important because the Indies are also beneficiaries in this contract and in this injunction. And the people behind it, yes? So the independents try to support Scientology against you? Against the, the punk against you? Yes. Okay. They, they benefit. They, yeah, they, they, so they support Scientology to fight against you? Yes, they, they are on the side of Scientology. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so then, in uh, I I then filed uh, a notice of appeal, and at that time, I am representing myself. This this created so much uh, huge problems in my life that. The lawyer that I was working for could no longer hire me because I could not work in his office because he was involved with Scientology. So I couldn't talk to him. It was just so complex and so nuts. So I was representing myself, but I appropriately filed a notice of appeal and uh, yeah, I, I carried on to whatever, whatever degree I could. The, the file at that point that I had made, because I, was, I had no money, the court was obliged to create the record on which the appeal is based. So it's about that, that big. And it, it's an incredible record, and sometime some lawyer will get a hold of it and it will be a gold mine. Um, in the beginning of, of 1997, I got my first internet account and just surfing the web at that time, I came across Scientology's submission, part of it, to the IRS. And this is the submission on which its tax exemption is based, the tax exemption that it got in 1993. This, now we're into 1997. This contained some pages of black propaganda on me that they used to get their tax exemption. The submission states that for years the IRS had depended on the Jerry Armstrong case in order to continue to deny the tax exemption. And now, when Scientology feels that they have me completely silenced, then they file a bunch of false material about me to the IRS. Now we know that Marty Rathbun was the person, Rathbun and Rinder were the people who filed those materials with the IRS. Rathbun has admitted that they prepared those documents. And that's another reason why Rathbun and Rinder do not come forward and why they are complete phonies. 
So when I saw this, then I realized what this whole thing is about. There, there are billions of dollars involved. And it all kind of depends on black PRing me so that they can have their tax exemption. Sometime later, I found even more black PR. There's 10 pages on me in this submission. And it's really nasty stuff. Jerry Armstrong, uh, sorted, you know, sorted history. Uh, they state that we of the church believe that uh, ev everyone else, all of these other litigants, you know, all of these other victims were motivated by greed. The sole exception is Jerry Armstrong that the, we of the church true, believe is truly psychotic. So you, you make up your mind. You know, I don't think a psychotic can do this. In any case, I saw this, this material and then I knew what it was about and I determined that I have to get away from, from the U.S. And I made plans at that time to leave my home, which was then in California, and uh, to go to Canada, where, where I now live. Before I left, um, uh, one of your famous cohorts, uh, Grady Ward, one of the heroes of the Scientology battle, served me with a, a subpoena for production of documents. In his case, he was then defending a, a, a copyright infringement case against Scientology. And uh, I, got, I got his subpoena, and the following day I got a, um, a fax from Scientology attorney threatening that if I responded to this subpoena, that they would prosecute me. So, now that's unlawful, because now I am a subpoenaed witness in a federal case, and I'm being threatened by the other attorney that if I respond lawfully, I'm going to be hit, prosecuted. So, I wrote a declaration, at that time, and sent it to the federal judge who was over top of the Grady Ward case. And uh, then I left the country. Uh, while, I, while I was in Canada, Scientology then went to the judge and got what's called a contempt of court order against me for communicating to that judge about what had happened to me. So the the, their friendly judge, not the, there are two courts in the United States, federal state court. My case was in California state court. Grady Ward's case was in federal court. So I sent the declaration, as I should, to the federal court judge. The judge in the state court issued an order of contempt against me without me ever being served. I had no notification. But he issued the uh, order of contempt against me. And then Scientology took that order and went to the Court of Appeal, where, my, where I had appealed from the injunction and from the judgment against me. And then claimed that I was a fugitive from justice. So therefore I had no right. So therefore they got rid of my appeal. So therefore the injunction stood and the, and the judgment stood against me. I continued to communicate. Uh, shortly after that, I came, I came to Germany for the first time. I spoke here in Germany. They went back to the court and got a, another injunction again, or another um, contempt of court uh, order against me for speaking here in Germany, for speaking in Russia, for speaking in Denmark. 
So this applies all over the world. And each one of these contempt of court orders comes with jail time and fines. So the jail time is rather minimum. It adds up to 28 days. Although if you don't have the money to pay the fines, then they add that on to your jail time. And the fact is that they got like something like uh, two days jail time for each utterance, each time I spoke. Now, of course, I have spoke tens of thousands of times, so or hundreds of thousands of times, so the jail sentences against me would go on for the rest of my life. So, now, and then, then they, so they, they ended up getting three of these contempt of court orders against me. What is important as far as Rathbun and Rinder are concerned is taking care of these orders and going back and uh, testifying as to the pressure that was put on Flynn, my attorney, that drove him to malpractice against me and to put me in that position where Flynn was forcing me to sign this contract. Rathbun, as I said, was involved in framing Flynn with this $2 million check forgery. Rinder was involved. And the information that they have between them could very much help to correct all of these injustices. The fact that they do not come forward and continue instead to black PR me indicates to me that they are phonies, they do not want to correct the evils at all, and I think that it's quite obvious, it can be observed, that what they complain about are the things that are done inside the organization. They do not say anything about the injustices and crimes which were committed against people outside the organization. But instead, they continue to black PR them. Their, their positioning is, and you may have seen this in what Rathbun has written, that the critics of Scientology are just as evil as David Miscavige. Yes? So do you think they want to be the new heads of Scientology to create a new Scientology under their control? Yes. Uh, it's already happening. You, you can already see I mean, that... Free Zone and Indians. Yeah, free, free Zone, and I must say that in, in the... I have met up to Rathbun and Rinder's arrival. I had met many independents. I do not agree with the philosophy, and I would argue with them about the philosophy. But they, they were accommodating and understanding to some degree. David Mayo, he was an independent for a while. And I met with him and we talked freely. He did not consider me an enemy or an evil person. But Rathbun and Rinder's arrival on the scene has changed things. And they, they are a Scientology entity. The independents are a Scientology, enti in Scientology entity. The Free Zone, Ron Zord, those are all Scientology entities. They are all beneficiaries in this injunction. Not one Scientologist has ever come forward and said, I want to be removed as a beneficiary. I don't like what's being done. So yes. you think, so you think um, independent ones or the free zones are more like different confessions of the religion? Like, uh, different like, factions. Yeah. Like, like, like Catholic and... But they have more in common than, than you okay. think. Oh, okay. I have a concern that that everyone will say, as they do, oh, David Miscavige is the source of all the problems. 
L. Ron Hubbard was wonderful. The tech is wonderful. Scientology is wonderful. David Miscavige is the only problem. So, David Miscavige goes off, lives on the Riviera, and Scientology continues on and has conned the whole world with the idea that, oh, things have reformed. There's no reformation. The reformation will happen when they repair what they've done to people outside, when they repair the lies that they've told, when they've repaired the injustices that they've committed. That's when we'll see some reformation. Mm -hmm. yes? uh, what do you think about uh, Marty Rathbun being arrested as a and at his home? And uh, I don't know the place, but do you know the squirrel busters? Sure. Yeah, what do you think about that? I mean, he's done that in the past, but I don't think it's cool either from the squirrel busters to arrest Molly Rathbun. Un unless it's a scheme with him. Oh, yeah. And so the, unless, yeah. He's, unless he's a, a willing participant. It must be remembered that they're the loyalists. And the loyalists did the same thing. They came to me and said, we have to meet in secret because we are afraid for our lives. Fair game. What have they done? What have they really done? There are no lawsuits. And, and, and the black propaganda that, that they share between themselves, there's nothing about the real victims. It must be remembered that as tragic as it is, the people in the sea organization, to some degree at least, sign on. They know what's happening. So they participate in this thing. But how about the people who don't sign on, the logs? Those are the people that, that should be defended. Those are the people that Marty should be speaking up for. He doesn't do anything about the falsehoods that L. Ron Hubbard told. He doesn't do anything about the fact that Scientology doesn't work and that they lure people in for millions of dollars and that they commit evils against people. I, you probably know that Rathbun has spoken up about what was done to some degree to Lisa McPherson because Lisa McPherson is dead. Rathbun even speaks about things that were done to influence the judge in the Lisa McPherson case. What was done to influence the judge in my case where I'm still alive and where the case still goes on? He says nothing but black PRs me. Yeah, I, I read a letter from Marty Rathbun. You wrote that at a stage that if you wrote an appropriate letter to him, that he would answer you, but he didn't. Yeah. So what do you think about that? Our, I don't know. He, he, said oh, a, he said quite other. He said, when you give me a straight communication that doesn't attack me as a devil, we'll talk about that. But apparently he, Jerry, is incapable of that. Maybe when he gets a grip on himself, I'll sort it out with him. Yeah. Okay. So are my communications straightforward enough for you to understand? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. And I actually have written Rathbun a number of times. And I, I first wrote him because he came on ex-Scientologist message board and said that he is offering to help anyone who has left the Sea Org and no longer expects to go back. That's me. So I wrote him and said, yes, that, that's me and here's how I need help. Rathbun knows about, I, I wrote a, a book in 1984. Uh, it, it contains original writing and original artwork and other documents. My car was broken into and the briefcase containing these documents was stolen. Jesse Prince and, and um, Vicky Asmaran have both told me that Scientology, that Ms. Cabbage, has my materials. Rathbun participated in that. Rathbun's agent stole it from my car. 
Rathbun could help me get it back. He doesn't talk about it. I wrote Rathbun several times, and he wrote me back a letter, an email, that says, Jerry, I, ha I have a hard time following your communication. Now, this is a standard black propaganda action by Scientologists to say that I, I, I'm not understandable. Logs have no trouble understanding me, and they are the people who supposedly have this great understanding and great wisdom. So, he continues, and this is because I had written asking for, for his help. He said, there are some critical differences between you and I. That's between you and me, but that's okay. You were willing to lie and did. I'm not. This is Marty talking about himself. This is September 6, 2009. The, the uh, 2009 article in the St. Pete Times had come out in which he stated about lying about David Miscavige. So just weeks before, he had admitted, and he said, this is the worst lie I ever told. And here he said he never had lied. I, I lie, he doesn't, therefore he won't help me. He continues on. You decided to become a victim and relish it so much You've continued to be one to this day. Everything you utter is through the prism of a victim, and to the degree that it is refracted as such, it is false. So essentially he's saying, everything I say is false, because I'm a victim. I am devoted to helping people from entering the dark, dank dungeon of victimhood. So he postulates me in this I am a victim. And being a victim in Scientology is a terrible thing. You cannot be a victim. This is actually the mental process of a psychopath. The psychopath, when a person protests that they're a victim, then they say, oh, you're being a victim. So th this is something really, really nasty, what he's saying here, if you understand what Scientology is about. He continues, you sold out 23 years ago and are apparently still mad at yourself for the indelible taint it left. I will never sell out. And the sell out that he's talking about is what I just talked to you about. So, it is what he created, what Scientology created. They created this document. They forced me to sign this document. And now they attack me for selling out to them. So it's like, it's perverse. It's truly evil. <coughs> if you made a genuine reach to reverse the downward spiral, A to C, that's these things about the lying and being victim and selling out, set you on, then I'd be glad to assist you in your about face and ascent. So, essentially, if, if I grovel before Marty Rathbun, and if, if, I, if I say that everything I said was a lie, and if I do other ridiculous things that are impossible, what downward spiral am I on? I've simply survived as an ordinary being for 30 years against this thing. So, has it left an indelible taint? It's true, it's hurt. But am I an evil person? Am I smeared because I signed their document that they prepared and they forced me to sign? I, I don't think so. I don't buy this. This is very perverse. Yes? Do you think any reformation could help Scientology to be a good religion? I mean, uh, I think there's no um, other way than just close this religion, this concern. But, yeah. Correct. You, you cannot take Hubbard out of Scientology. And 
and Hubbard was a psychopath. And the whole process of... <laughs> <laughs> the whole process of Scientology, I believe, in, installs in a person a, a psychopathic condition in which they, they don't have any guilt, they, they lie with relative impunity, they feel totally good about lying. They don't care for their fellow human beings. They have no remorse. And uh, I believe that it, that it is, in most cases, a temporary condition, because you can see that when someone leaves the Scientology program and becomes again reestablished as a WOG, as an ordinary human being, as homo sapiens, most of them become decent, contributing citizens again. <coughs> but it, it is well known that, uh, that a psychopathic condition can be installed in, in a group. Mm -hmm. Gangs form. form. Mm -hmm. The Mafia is something similar. Mm -hmm. You saw it in the, in the German history, a glaring example uh -huh. of where people completely lost their humanity. So it becomes sort of a, a mob thing, and you cannot get away from it unless you leave Scientology. And those people have not left Scientology. So the and, and, they didn't really leave Scientology. They have not left Scientology. And I believe that, that there are there are a lot of attractions to, to the psychopathic condition. You don't have a conscience, so you can do things uh, without any concern. There are terrible disadvantages, and it's not good for the mind, it's not good for the soul. But they don't care. They don't have any restraints. They can lie and then not be bothered. Just tell more lies. That's what Hubbard did, and that's what Scientologists do. And that's a, that's a tremendous advantage over people who tell the truth. But as disadvantaged as we are with having to tell the truth, I would not trade my condition for a psychopath's condition ever. My conscience is too valuable. Uh, I. I think uh, I've covered a lot of ground, and uh, you've asked some good questions along the way. Any other questions? Uh, yes? Yeah. I have a question on the authenticity of some documents that I prevailed on the internet about LRH. Uh, there's a site, Documents of the Lifetime, um, and there's a letter from Alan Hubbard where he requests psychiatric help. Yes. From 1949 or something. 47, I think. 47, yes. Is this real? Absolutely. It came out of his archive. Okay. He had it in his own archive. Okay, and then, do you know the website? Uh, I, I believe so. Okay, and I mean, all these documents, I, they're... I can't say yeah, okay. every document, but that one for sure okay. is real. Yeah. Okay, that, that's actually it, yeah. Uh, I'm sure I gave you... My, my email and these things. Um, so you can ask about particular documents and I'm willing to talk about all of his documents. The, the famous admissions are real. Hubbard's affirmations. Uh, all the documents on my own site, my wife Caroline's site, she has a huge site. They're all real. Any other questions? Yes, yes. more questions. Um, I would ask it uh, about the contract. Um, if there was pressure, you said, it's like in Germany, uh, the contract would be laid down, yes? yes. But um, in Germany, I know also there's a, there are other possibilities, uh, but I don't know the English word for that. The, uh, other defenses? 
Yes, uh, there was Willensmangel, uh, was heißt das auf Englisch? Uh, lack of will. Lack of will. Yes. Lack of free will. Yes. Correct. Or, or fraud. Uh, fraud is another right. Yes. In yes. this case, mm -hmm. the fraud exists yes. because because of the, the fraud that Scientology, through my attorney, promised to end fair games. Yes. Uh, so that that's fraud. Yes. And and was this a possibility to lay down it? Uh, th that was that was one of the one of the defenses. I had many defenses. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. First Amendment defenses mm -hmm. uh, for the for liquidated damages uh, to to be valid. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for liquidated damages to be valid, there there must be uh, discussion. There must be negotiation. There was none. It was either take it or leave it. But I could not leave it because all of these <coughs> other people depended on fair game ending. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So, I, I, I've got the present okay. the presentation, yes. yes. Okay. We, we asked a lot of even politicians, politicians in Germany mm -hmm. uh, to help and uh, what they said was, oh, this is not unforeseeable in Germany, mm -hmm. but uh, in the United States. And I, I, I even spoke with the first secretary of the U.S. Embassy in Berlin, and he said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is only valid in California, not in the United States. But body snatcher go around, also in New York, so the U.S. has no safe place for him. Even when he came here, the uh, travel office said, you can't go buy a flight or chairs there landing in the United States. Uh, also, one, one more point, this, this order against me, the injunction against me, also applies to persons acting in concert with me. And uh, you, you may have seen the, there's a famous video that was made of the Vanonymous people. And by the way, uh, Vanonymous, that's the anonymous a uh, cell in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, and I bring greetings from Vanonymous. Um, but there's a famous video that they made in which uh, 50 people all, all got together, you know, with signs, I'm in concert with Jerry. So to act in concert with me, it requires nothing more than that you speak about Scientology and that you help the victims of Scientology. Those are the things which are prohibited by the injunction. So it isn't just that I may not speak about Scientology, I may not help anybody in any way, victims of Scientology or persons adverse to Scientology. So I cannot help the government. But this applies to people acting in concert with me. So, I ask all of you, would you act in concert with me? No problem. <laughs> Fine. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, after you went out of Scientology, did you try to find another religion that could tell you the truth of life or that you had uh, just a feeling be involved in a group of persons who believe in the same things? Yes, I, I in fact have uh, studied a lot about religion, about theology uh, since leaving. I am a Christian. Okay. So, what do you expect with Scientology in the future? What's going on there? How is it going with this organization? Is it a big a suicide, or what's going on? Of course, I, I uh, don't have a crystal ball. Um, what I would work toward is the education of the public to the point where Scientology is no longer able to recruit, 
and that they are known worldwide as a criminal organization. Uh, <coughs> whether or not that will happen in my lifetime, I don't know. I believe that it is a, a goal of Rathbun and Rinder and their indie supporters to prevent that from happening. But that is really the only defense we have. We cannot ban them any more than you can ban people from being psychopaths. You cannot do that. So ban banning will not work. I believe that they are going to continue uh, to get in more and more trouble. And I think that uh, the, the internet is creating really the last generation of Scientologists because children are being raised with internet access no matter where they are. You just have to have access and minds are inquisitive and they're going to find out. Uh, Scientology is going to continue to recruit of course and as I say the psychopathic state or condition is quite attractive and in fact that's what they're selling. Um, and they have a method quite obviously of creating creating that in a person. But I do not think that they will triumph. I think that good will prevail. I think that education is the answer. Thank you. Uh, one, one question is that uh, just uh, this moment, known worldwide as a criminal organization, um, is uh, also known about other countries in uh, the, United, the United States that there uh, are made criminal uh, operations like you told us, uh, perhaps in Germany, uh, and why aren't they uh, prosecuted in Germany uh, as a criminal organization? I know the German <laughs> prosecutors are very uh, busy in some other cases, uh, also in cases of religions, uh, to prosecute criminal organizations or uh, to, yes. Be because uh, Scientology walks that uh, very, very narrow line right on the edge of fraud, criminality, and, and uh, they have uh, tremendous uh, resources and they're willing to expend immense amounts of money uh, government. That's one of the extreme ironies is that after this prosecution, the U.S. reversed itself and made an ally of this organization. And I think that they did that for the very reason that they knew that Scientology is one of those borderline, if not criminal, organization. So, and, and with a huge intelligence network. So the U.S. made this decision, rather than fight them, to make an ally of them. That's a real problem because the U.S., as a result, has turned its back on Scientology's victims, such as myself. I was a federal witness, and the U.S. could have come to my defense. But I think that as uh, there, there is an awakening awareness of psychopathy or sociopathy in society, and I think that as people become more and more educated in that subject, and at the same time about Scientology as a psychopathic organization, that there's a great deal of hope that they will become observed that way and, and ostracized and treated as a, as a criminal organization just the same way that the Mafia is. The Mafia is known as a criminal organization, but that does not mean that all of the Mafia can be rounded up and that you can get rid of it. It can't.
Yeah. So you believe that the law would fight against tranquility and would go on the underground and and do things like the mafia would do. So um, um, yes. would, would, would would do criminal things for people and uh, to, to collect money to go on and go on forever. Well, uh, that's. I don't think it's in exactly the same form, but uh, they already do that in some countries. They don't, they don't uh, in some countries, even call themselves a religion. In some, and they have been banned. But they also have continued, but I think that they are, there's a, a reinvigoration and a greater understanding of the organization and it's paralleling this increased understanding of psychopathy. Now whether or not people with conscience will rise up and say no that's it enough because that's really what's needed when that happens government has to follow. Because they, they really do defraud people mm. and and they extort from people. Those are the tools that the Mafia uses. They run a protection racket. Ja, herzlichen Dank für die, für die Ausführung und herzlichen Dank für die Aufmerksamkeit. Ähm, weder, also ein Verbot von Scientology kann die Probleme nicht endgültig lösen, trotzdem bin ich für weitgehende äh, rechtliche Maßnahmen. Ähm, halte das für richtig, aber noch wichtiger ist die geistige Auseinandersetzung. Dazu haben wir versucht jetzt beizutragen. Und natürlich ist sehr, sehr wichtig, äh, man könnte sagen, also dieses bürgerschaftliche Engagement, was Anonymous zeigt, dass äh, auch die Politiker nicht, nicht weggucken können, was ja immer wieder versucht wird. Und es hilft natürlich auch nicht, oder um sozusagen nochmal zum Anlass der heutigen Sitzung zurückzukommen, es hilft auch nicht weiße Salbe und zu sagen, ja, es ist alles gar nicht so schlimm oder gar es ist Religion und in der Religion sind sowieso alle verrückt und da kann man das ruhig machen, weil das nur eine Rechtfertigung für die wirklich ähm, kriminellen Machenschaften ist, wenn man auf äh, Village Voice oder selbst auf den, selbst auf Wari Protest äh, die Diskussion verfolgt, dann sieht man, dass die, ähm, dass die andere Seite wirklich in einer ganz üblen Weise persönliche Angriffe fährt. Ähm, also alle weiße Salbe und alles gesund beten hilft ja nicht. Sondern äh, wir, wir haben vor vielen Jahren mal diesen Begriff äh, versucht zu etablieren. Es geht um die Auseinandersetzung mit dem Habardismus nicht mit dieser oder jener Organisation, sondern mit der totalitären Ideologie des Habardismus. Und Bestandteil dieser Ideologie ist zum Beispiel Fair Game. Und Bestandteil dieser Ideologie ist, dass es kein, kein Lebensrecht für Leute, die nicht produktiv sind, gibt und so weiter. Und deshalb also, ähm, möchte ich Ihnen danken, dass Sie in der Öffentlichkeit sozusagen die Frage einfach immer wieder offen halten. Und ich möchte nochmal Jerry danken, dass er äh, so viel uns heute. Yes. 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 Yes.